Today in Israel and for Jewish people around the world, an annual cycle of holidays provide welcome timeouts from the routines of life. By rest and remembrance, their ancient Jewish culture is renewed. But do these God-appointed festivals recorded by Moses hold meaning only for the people of Israel? These three Jewish men are convinced that there are specific links between the life of Jesus and the feast days of Israel, links that reveal Jesus as the Messiah of Israel and Savior of the world. The appointed times, Jesus in the feasts of Israel, on this day of discovery. This is the land of the Bible, the nation of Israel, whose calendar reminds its people of the appointed times of the Lord, times of rest and remembrance, specific times that look back and times that point to the future. Clustered in the spring and the fall, these holy feast days are tied to the agricultural cycle of Israel. There are a total of seven holidays based on a lunar calendar that follows the phases of the moon the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. According to the creation account in the book of Genesis, these sacred appointed times were in the mind of God from the very beginning. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. Genesis chapter 1. The three of us have thought a lot about the feasts of Israel. They've been part of our spiritual journeys. We're all Jewish. Avner Bosky makes his home in the south of Israel, in Beersheba, where Abraham lived. Avner's a guide, a musician, and a teacher of the Bible. Michael Brown hosts a national radio program in the US. Mike's also a Hebrew scholar and an author. I'm Michael Radelnik. I'm a professor of Jewish studies and Bible, and I also host a national radio program. We met in Israel to explore the compelling links between Jesus, or Yeshua as he's called in Hebrew, and the feasts of Israel. Since the appointed times or holidays follow the harvest cycle, we chose to meet here at the Biblical Landscape Reserve. It's called Neot Kedumim in Hebrew. Here, 625 acres with 250,000 hand-planted trees and shrubs of the Bible have recreated the setting for how life was lived 3,000 years ago. The only source of water in Israel is rainwater. And it rains here only, at best, between mid-November until, if we're very lucky, middle end of March. During those few months, all of our water needs for the rest of the year have to be supplied. That is just as true today as it was in the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That water gives life to grain, grapes, dates, pomegranates, and olives. Here, an ancient olive press has been reconstructed. Olives placed in the trough are crushed by a stone wheel, providing oil for cooking and oil for lamps. The annual feasts of Israel have led each of us to spiritual insights and discoveries. And we're convinced that they continue to have deep meaning and significance for everyone. They call us back to God, and they reveal Jesus, or Yeshua, as the Messiah of Israel and the forgiver of the world. So Avner, what are these feasts, and why did God give them to Israel? He gave seven different festivals to kind of outline the calendar year, so it would have had an agricultural aspect in terms of the crops and what's happening at different times of the year. It would have had, the feasts would have also had an issue of uh, uh, history, like moving out of Egypt and remembering that in the Exodus, so it's a historical festival. And that would have had a sense of looking forward to 
the end of days and also to the Messiah, which would be in the sense of prophetic understanding of the feast. So there's a past, uh, an immediate and an ultimate meaning. Right, and it's yeah. a remembrance too. Yeah, and uh, why did God want this for Israel? You see, we've got to remember that Israel passed on its truths, its traditions by repetition, by lifestyle, by calendar. Every week, the Sabbath and what it remembered, creation and exodus from Egypt. So the same thing with the feasts and the holy days. This was something that became the fabric of the life of the nation. They would look back to the things that God did in the past. It would give them meaning for the present, and then they'd be looking forward. So there is that, that past, present, future. They say, come back, come celebrate me again, come worship me again. And that's why they have this annual repetitive cycle. And I think it's a great thing for all of us because we all tend to get caught up in this sort of regular, regularness, the, the normalcy of life, day to day, you know, hand to mouth living. And God says, wait a minute, come back, remember me. And, and I think that's why in the creation narrative, God says that he's going to put the, he put the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky to count times and seasons, uh, the festivals, so that Israel would remember that the, when they look up at the sun, moon, and stars, remember the festivals are coming. So. It's interesting in Leviticus 23 how God said, these are my festivals. Yeah. Uh, so there's an aspect where it's kind of precious to him in some way. He said, the week, the month, the festivals throughout the year, I want you to keep coming back to me and remembering my work and who I am. But it would be easy for Israel to forget her God Israel had settled into her promised land. Israel's 12 tribes had spread out to their own territories. The pilgrimage feasts that became centered in Jerusalem were God's way of uniting the tribal nation of Israel. Unlike the other nations, they had no king. God was their king. So the feasts were to keep Israel close and faithful to one God, the God who had brought them out of Egypt. The first commandment given to this new nation stated emphatically, you shall have no other gods before me. While wandering in Sinai for 40 years, there was no competition from the gods of Egypt or other gods, but Israel's belief in only one God would soon be tested. Where did the problems begin? When the children of Israel enter the Promised Land, and here we begin to change from a nomadic tribe to a settled nation, where we have to begin farming in the very difficult ecological reality of Israel and the climatic reality of Israel, there are suddenly problems and threats that we never knew in Sinai. Here you have contrasting uh, elements of weather. Here you have all kinds of other problems in terms of agriculture that the Israelites weren't familiar with before. I always imagine the scene in my head of an Israelite coming here, he's settling down and he has his Canaanite neighbor telling him, okay, fine, you've been brought out of Egypt by your God, you're gonna build a temple to him in Jerusalem and he's your God of history, but what does he know about the local problems? He's not from around the neighborhood, you know? So why don't you bring little offerings to our local guys? They know what it's all about, to the Baal who was the God of rain and the Tammuz who was the God of sun and the most famous of all, the Ashtoreth, the goddess of fertility. We're not asking you to exchange them, just add, add them onto the list, because they're local and they know all about all the problems. And it's exactly that problem, that constant temptation to be lured away to serve other gods, that the prophets of the first temple period fought about all the time. This was the temptation, to be lured away to, to, to hedge your bets, okay? To, to pay premiums to the local insurance companies because they know what it's all about. And that's where the terrible conflict came to accept this revolution that says, no, it is one omniscient, omnipotent being. You can't make statues of him. You can't um, see him. He is the God of history and he is the God of all of nature. You, the individual farmer, may be caught between the rains and the winds and your, your problems of pollination and fertilization, but it is all in the hands of this one omniscient, omnipotent God. And you're gonna to have to accept that on faith. And that's where the drama begins. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. 
lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you. And he shut up the heavens, so that there be no rain, and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Those words from Deuteronomy are part of what God commanded every Jewish person to symbolically write on the doorposts of their homes. In time, these words were literally placed on the door frames in a small box called a mezuzah. Also included is the foundational yet loving command for the nation. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Deuteronomy chapter 6. So the land of Israel was promised poetically to be a land which drinks rain from heaven. It sounds really good, but it also meant that if Israel didn't obey God, they wouldn't get any rain. So there was this dependence built into the very geography of the land of Israel. Egypt had water, the Nile River. Turkey, huge rivers and lots of rain. Israel, whatever it got, it had to pray for. It doesn't just happen. You go out day after day, week after week, month after month. Discipline is necessary for physical and spiritual growth. Sometimes it feels great. Other times, it hurts. But you keep at it. It takes time. And you make it a priority. It might not be easy, but it's worth it. Our daily bread can help you connect with God daily. Visit odb.org slash fitness to learn more. The focus for the annual spring and fall feasts of the Lord became Jerusalem. We're looking at a model of Jerusalem from 2,000 years ago, made of limestone, and this shows us the temple which was ground zero, the center point of Jerusalem, where the priests gathered at the feasts along with the, all the 12 tribes of Israel to worship the Lord, to serve Him, and to sacrifice at the feasts of Israel. Standing here on the Mount of Olives, we're looking over the Kidron or Jehoshaphat Valley toward the Temple Mount. 2,000 years ago, this is where the temple stood in Jesus' day. Today you have the Golden Dome, the Dome of the Rock. But going back to the time of Jesus, this was the mountain where the focus was on the feast, the focal point of God's festivals. When you think about it, that all the men of Israel three times a year had to come up to Jerusalem, that wasn't such an easy thing. If you lived in the Galilee, you couldn't go at a certain time through Samaria because there were unfriendly people there. So you'd have to get on a donkey. They say, you know, it takes five days by foot, six days by donkey. And then you'd have to come down on the Jordanian side, what we call Jordan today, on the east side of the Jordan River, the King's Highway, and come down where you would find kosher delicatessens or whatever a Jewish person would need. And then come all the way down toward the ford, which would be opposite Jerusalem. It wasn't an easy journey, it took time. Today, these ancient appointed times of the Lord are still celebrated by Jewish people around the world. You know what's interesting is that even in homes that are not very religious, Jewish homes, these are still things people get involved with. The synagogue where I was bar mitzvah what was so small that sometimes my dad would get a call on a Saturday morning, Abe, can you come down? Because they didn't have 10 men for the minion, for the prayer group. And yet for the high holy days, they, held to, they had to build an annex that seated several hundred people because everyone was going to show up. So somehow this is a time when Jewish people get more religious, the Passover Seder, the meal. This is a communal thing in families across the world. When you, when you get to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, you have even irreligious Jews who are fasting, and then in the religious community, everything stops. Normal life stops. 
I remember living in Maryland near an Orthodox Jewish bookstore, and in the days leading up to the fall holy days, they would have stacks of books on repentance because everyone's examining their life. So the, the, the life cycle of Israel really revolves around these things, even to this day, even for secular Jews. There have been some changes, and, and what are they? Well, one of the interesting things is, of course, we've had 2,700 years of exile. So we've been gone. So it's hard to keep festivals dealing with the agricultural la la year calendar cycle of Israel when you're, let's say, in Russia or in New York. In Brooklyn, we didn't. Right. <laughs> so I remember, for instance, keeping the Feast of Tabernacles and building this booth or the sukkah when it was nearly snowing in, in Montreal, Canada. So it wasn't at all the yeah. same way that you read it there. But uh, I would say that over time, Jews have developed traditions uh, just like most people. Some aspects are biblical, some aspects are not biblical. Many Jewish people don't always know the difference between those two. Well, you know, the biggest change that came about and the way these holidays are changed is the destruction of the temple. Because so much of the festivals, it was an annual pilgrimage feast. You came to Jerusalem, you celebrated the temple. And of course, for example, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, it all centered around a sacrifice. And today there's no sacrifice. The temple was destroyed in A.D. 70 by Roman General Titus. In Rome, the Arch of Titus celebrates that victory. The pictorial relief in the arch presents the golden lampstand called the menorah that was taken from the temple. Today, in Jerusalem, stones from the Temple Mount lie as witnesses of where they fell. According to the Gospels of the New Testament, Jesus had predicted this destruction and was grieved because Israel hadn't embraced him as their Messiah. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew chapter 23. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Mark chapter 13. When the sacrifices ceased at the temple in A.D. 70, according to the law of the Lord, there was no other way for Israel to cover personal and national sin and no place to approach a holy God. But a movement had already begun within Judaism as followers of Jesus saw him as the suffering Messiah who sacrificed his life for all people. We all come from different walks of life. We all face different concerns. But there's a place we can all turn to find hope and encouragement for our lives. Take the time to know God with our daily bread. Seeing Jesus, or Yeshua, as the fulfillment of the temple sacrifices and the appointed feasts comes into sharper focus in the writings of the New Testament. So how does the New Testament use the festivals? Those early Messianic Jews who wrote the New Testament, what are they saying about them? You know, it's fascinating is they talk about them. For example, Paul writing to the Corinthians, assuming that the Gentile audience they're writing to will now understand these as well, that they know something about Israel's history and calendar. So the Gospels plainly associate Passover with the time of Messiah's death. 
John the Immerser sees him in John 129 and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the foundational holy day, the Passover, what does that begin with? Blood sacrifice, Passover lamb. Take the day of atonement, which happens about five, six months later. What's central there? Blood, blood, blood. The blood of the goats, and then a goat sent out to the wilderness to carry away the sins of the nation. So sacrifice and offering were central. Tabernacles, Sukkot, 70 bulls offered up, ultimately symbolizing the 70 nations of the earth. So there were times of thanksgiving, there were times of celebration, there were times of remembrance, there were times of introspection, but every one of them had a foundational level of blood sacrifices being offered. You cannot divorce the feasts and holy days from the temple and the blood sacrifices. And what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, where he expects them to know, he says, Messiah, our Passover has been sacrificed. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, therefore let us keep the feast, not with the leavened bread of, of sin and iniquity, but unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, speaking of, of first fruits, which takes place on the first day after the Sabbath the within first Passover. The first of the two first fruits observances. Right, the, the first day after the Sabbath within Passover. So Messiah rises the first day after the Sabbath within Passover on a Sunday. And Paul says he's become the first fruits of those asleep. So the first fruits was an anticipation of, of a harvest that was yet to come. Yes. And so Messiah's resurrection is the harvest, the first resurrection, and so now we can anticipate that those of us who have faith in him will also experience resurrection. Exactly. We've got uh, Passover and unleavened bread and the first first fruits, mm -hmm. and yet there's also Pentecost or the, the, the 50 days or the feast of uh, weeks that follow. So what's the new, how does the New Testament use that? Now here's what's fascinating. Jewish tradition tries to date things and claims that the Torah was given on Mount Sinai, that this corresponds to the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. That's what the, Jewish the, tradition the five, says. The first five books of the law. Right. So here's what's fascinating now, is that we have the giving of the Spirit, Pentecost, Shavuot. Remember, Pentecost is not a Christian church holiday. Pentecost is Jewish. It's Shavuot. Even it's if a, it has a Greek name. Right, right. Yeah. It's, it's the biblical calendar. So you have the tongues of fire, at Pentecost, Acts the second chapter, you have the fire of God on the mountain. Jewish tradition even says God spoke in multiple languages at Mount Sinai so everyone would hear. And as a result of the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, Israel immediately rebels, there's judgment, and 3,000 Israelites are killed. In the book of Acts, Peter preaches after the giving of the Spirit, and 3,000 Israelites are saved. I mean, talk about an intentional parallel. So the apostles, these first Jewish followers of Yeshua, are seeing absolutely not only do these feasts and holy days have a historical significance, but also prophetic. They are pointing to the Messiah, and that carries and right do. over. Exactly. Yeah. His death, his resurrection, the giving of the Spirit. And what's amazing is we're not done yet. Mm -hmm. Israel's calendar continues, and the fall feasts and holy days are all pointing forward to things that God is going to do. So, Mike, you're telling me that Passover, the Jewish feast of Passover, was when Jesus was crucified, when Yeshua was crucified, and that he lay in the ground kind of as an unleavened bread on the second day, and he rose on the first fruits feast, and that the Holy Spirit fell on the day of the Feast of Pentecost. That's kind of four for four, a connection between the ministry of Yeshua the Messiah and these feasts. Mm -hmm. So what do you make of that? Well, the interesting thing is the fall feasts, we can't connect it with anything that has yet taken place. And yet there are connections in the New Testament to what will take place yet in the future through the fall feasts. For example, the Feast of Trumpets. That points us to a special kind of trumpet. Messiah's return, the trumpet blast, the shofar blast when he returns. That's right. There will be a great trumpet when Jesus returns, when Messiah comes back. And then, of course, when he comes back, that's the day when Israel looks upon him. Uh, it, it says in Zechariah 12, 10, we look upon him, the one that was pierced, and we will mourn as one mourns for an only National son. National atonement. National repentance. And then Zechariah says that that's the day when the fount is opened for atonement for Israel. And so the entire nation will come to know Messiah. Uh, and there'll be a day of atonement in a sense. Zechariah 12, Israel's repentance at the Messiah's return, trumpet blast. Zechariah 13, national atonement. And then Zechariah 14. It's the kingdom. 
the tabernacles, messianic kingdom, right? The, the nations come in. Coming yeah. in. Then the, that Messiah will be tabernacling right here uh, on earth and reigning over us, and all the nations will come to Jerusalem to worship him. Not far from where we're sitting right now, exactly. actually. Exactly. So yeah. we're saying that the prophets saw these feasts as having a, a future meaning as well. An ultimate significance, not just a past significance. So not only agriculture, not only history, but the life and ministry of Yeshua. At which to them was still prophetic. And a future restoration mm -hmm. yeah. here. So there was an immediate significance in the life of Israel, and there, would be, there was going to be an ultimate significance, as we see in Scripture. This is the biblical calendar. This was never meant to be some separated church thing. The Jews do this and the Christians do this. So it gives me an opportunity to call the church to remember its Jewish roots and also to now say... You're not trying to impose them and say, oh, you have to celebrate... Oh, no, no, it's the, the recognition. Roots. It's the spiritual recognition mm -hmm. of what's happening and that sense of connectedness and rootedness. And, and then also to say Israel's calendar has a future. I think Mike is saying... All believers in Jesus, in Yeshua, are grafted into this olive tree. Paul says we've all been made to drink of the sap of this tree. The rich root. And this is part of that heritage, mm -hmm. the festivals. So often I think that, that uh, non-Jewish followers of Jesus don't realize that this is part of their root and heritage as well. And, and that's a great reminder. Now, that, what I love about the festivals is that the festivals are the great wake-up call from God. Not just the, the, the Feast of Trumpets, but they all, because God knew Israel would wander and forget about him, so he set up the seasons and the festivals to say, wait, wait, remember me, keep worshiping me. And I think that that's what happened in our age, in our society, and we forget God, and he says, no, no, these, these festivals are set up, come back to me, uh, keep remembering me, and, and it will transform our lives. Amen. Absolutely. Uh, uh, to go to the bathroom. God is bigger than you ever could imagine. I mean, he can still fit in this classroom. God is bigger than me. Maybe like a house or something. And that's big. Really big. <laughs> I do have muscles, but... God's muscles are bigger, not by much. He's bigger than anything, by the way. He's everywhere. Heaven is really big. He's even bigger than a giant. I don't know about anything about strong stuff. Yeah, huge. God is, God is huge.